Thank you, everyone, for coming today. My name is Sally Sattel. I'm a resident scholar here at AEI. And our discussion today is on the role of mental health, uh, the role of the federal government in mental health policy. You know, we typically think of, of mental health as a, as a state responsibility. And to, to a large extent, it is. But the federal government has can have a very influential role in shaping services and policies for mentally ill patients. Unfortunately, in the last few decades, it hasn't used that influence very effectively. As everyone knows, we have a chaotic patchwork of services and huge gaps uh, through which mentally ill patients fall into the street and end up in jail. It's just a completely unacceptable and heartbreaking situation. The, uh, so today we have Representative Tim Murphy, uh, and our panel will discuss his proposed legislation called Helping Families in Mental Health Crisis Act. It addresses persistent problems in mental health care system, among them the shortage of psychiatric beds, there was just a hearing two days ago on that, the inadequate implementation of evidence-based treatment, small but real problem of violence by the mentally ill, our outdated involuntary commitment laws, and uh, the questionable priorities of the lead agency within HHS that is responsible for funding the services for the nation's mentally ill. Everyone on the panel who will respond uh, to, to Mr. Murphy's uh, comments are deeply dedicated to the patients and to the families who love them. So first I'll introduce Representative Murphy. Actually, I'm gonna introduce everyone. You have much fuller biographies at your desks, so I'm gonna be brief. And then we will begin. So Representative Murphy is currently in his sixth term in Congress representing the 18th District of Pennsylvania. He's a former psychologist. Actually, I guess you're still a psychologist. One always has one's degree. Um, with three decades of experience, he's the chairman of the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee of the House and Energy Commerce Committee, a co-chair of the Mental Health Caucus and founding member of GOP Doctors, for Doctors Caucus. He authored the Seniors Access to Mental Health Act, which ended the practice of charging co-payments to seniors on Medicare, and finally, he introduced and passed into law the Mental Health Security Act for America's Families and Education, which was instrumental in getting college students who were suffering from depression or psychosis the help they need before tragedy strike. Uh, next will be Dr. Jeffrey Lieberman, who is the Chairman of Psychiatry at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons also the director of the New York State Psychiatric Institute. His research expertise for years has been in schizophrenia and psychopharmacology, and this year he's the president of the American Psychiatric Association. Next is Patrick J. Kennedy, the co-founder of One Mind for Research. He served 16 years in the U.S. House of Representatives and was the author and lead sponsor of the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act of 2008. He's authored and co-sponsored dozens of other bills to increase understanding of mental illness and treatment. And finally, Dr. E. Fuller Torrey, who's a professor of psychiatry at the Uniformed Services University Health Services and a research psychiatrist specializing in schizophrenia and policy and uh, um, infectious disease in schizophrenia, which is a very interesting theory. Uh, he is a founder of the Treatment Advocacy Center and executive director of the Stanley Medical Research Institute. He's co-authored co numerous papers and 20 books, and that's our distinguished panel. So we'll start with Mr. Murphy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, that's convenient. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Uh, I don't know how to get the slides working. Does anybody? Do I know what we can do here? We'll move us into 21st century technology in just a moment here. 
Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be part of this distinguished panel uh, and uh, be, uh, have so many distinguished colleagues in the audience today, too. I wish I could say you're getting continuing education credits for this. Uh, that'd be nice, but uh, we'll move forward here. What I want to talk about here is um, H.R. 3717, this bill we introduced last December. I did it last December for a very important reason. Uh, I had committed to the parents uh, from Sand Hook Elementary School uh, that we would have this bill introduced before the anniversary of the tragedy. Uh, our nation has been rocked by several of these tragedies, and although those with mental illness uh, are not of the vast majority likely to be violent, they nonetheless uh, that it is an area of grave concern that so many of these tragedies have been committed by someone with severe, untreated mental illness. Uh, and, and that we need to deal with these things. So let's see if I can make this work. No, someone's going to sit there and make it work because I have no idea to do this, okay? This does look fascinating, nonetheless. Um, okay. All right, let me just keep talking here. Let me give you some numbers here because without this, nothing else is going to make sense to you. There are uh, about 60 million Americans, about 20% of our population or so, that have some degree of mental illness. From the mild, transient, uh, acute problem of anxiety or sadness to severe mental illness. About 9.6 Americans have a serious mental illness. And about 3.6 million are without treatment. Extremely important to understand what happens when someone is without treatment, because if someone it's without treatment, they can be more likely to exhibit some violent, aggressive, or assaultive tendencies. But when they're in treatment, there's a 15-fold decrease in the likelihood that they may become involved in violence. It's also important to know this. Some with mental illness has about three to four times more likelihood that they will be victims of violence, rape, assault, robbery, and this is where there's someone's in prison, on the street, or at home, or independent, um, whatever that might be. And children who are mentally ill, three times more likely to be victims of sexual abuse. Now, those numbers alone are pretty staggering and should move us towards action. But the problem is the actions that have been taken very much are wasteful, are misdirected, and we're not getting the services to people who need it. The federal government, however, already spends a lot of money, about $125 billion towards uh, mental illness. Most of that is for payments, uh, for disability, uh, some is for Medicaid, uh, very little is for research, uh, and very little is for getting out in terms of early treatment access. Well, what seems to happen, however, is where do these people go? Well, about 20 to 50 percent of people who are in our prisons are mentally ill. If you look at this next slide, you'll see that as we close the hospitals, particularly in the 1950s and 1960s, well, in the 1950s we had 550,000 inpatient psychiatric beds for a population in our nation of 150 million. As those beds close down, we now have about 40,000 hospital beds, but where have the patients gone? Sadly, those with serious mental illness, we have filled our prisons. So while states' budgets are uh, bursting at the seams with paying for prisons, uh, growth and expansion, um, and overpopulation in small prisons, it is no wonder why. It is not the crime is so vast and expanding in our nation, is that we have traded the hospital bed for a prison cell. We have also traded the hospital bed for a mattress in a flop house, in a homeless shelter, or a blanket over some subway grate in our cities. It is inhumane, it is immoral, and it puts us in something of a third world status. And even when we do take some action, such as a typical situation when a seriously mentally ill person uh, is having some acute breakdown, a psychotic break, aggressive, assaultive, threatening, the police are called, they take them to an emergency department, and what happens there? An ill-equipped and uh, an ill-staffed emergency room, which is not designed to deal with the mentally ill patient, is brought there, and what do they do? They tie them by their wrists and their legs to a gurney, oftentimes, too often, leave them in a hallway or in a room that simply is surrounded by a, sh uh, a sheet for some visible cover, 
And if the person gets out of control, they sedate them. What could be more inhumane than putting someone in jail, leaving them on the street, or chemically and physically handcuffing them to a bed and calling that treatment? It is wrong. And it's about time our nation woke up to understand that the plight that these patients face and the turmoil that their families feel about handling this has got to change. So in pursuit of this, over the last year, I held a series of hearings uh, in our oversight and investigation subcommittee. And here's what we learned. We learned that there's inadequate inpatient treatment options, simply not enough beds for those in acute crisis. Quite frankly, there's inadequate outpatient treatment options, too. Uh, our system uh, is, is far, far away from helping people get better, um, to recover, to get jobs again, to be independent housing. And we know this can happen. The treatment has been out there. There's a number of medications that work, a number of supportive services from uh, peer uh, help that can help. There are uh, community wraparound services. There are uh, treatment folks out there. But unfortunately, there's just not enough of that. In fact, there's a huge shortage of child psychiatrists and psychiatrists overall and psychologists, particularly those who treat serious mental illness. When you're talking about just 7,000 child psychiatrists for 15 million children, uh, and we need 30,000. That's a serious problem. People can't get help. And when there is no help, there is no hope. And when there's no hope, people feel this stigma of going from place to place, emergency room to emergency room, police squad, car to car. And it's no wonder they feel a stigma because we're part of a society that ignores or maltreats those with mental illness. Another problem we found is that the HIPAA laws, or that Health Insurance Privacy Act, and also the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act are subject to a great deal of confusion. They're supposed to be there to protect confidentiality of records, to make sure doctors don't release records inappropriately. I agree. To make sure the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act is there to make sure people aren't getting school records and other records that don't need to be out there. What they have become is another barrier because people, for fear of releasing anything, oftentimes do nothing at all. Uh, we've had many times people testified before a committee where parents we're in a hospital trying to convince someone else, I need to tell you about the history of my son or daughter. And people saying, we can't talk to you unless we have permission. You can't get permission from someone who doesn't even know where they are, that is so severely uh, involved in delusions and, and psychosis and, and paranoia at that moment, they don't know who they are. And yet we're telling people, well, until we get their permission, we can't tell you anything. That's wrong. And it's a misinterpretation of the law. It works like this. You know, if you're in an auto accident and you're unconscious, or you have a stroke and you're incoherent, no one says we have to wait until you get better before we make a decision to treat you. We don't do that. Why is it we do that with someone who's in the middle of deep depression, deep di bipolar disorder, or deep psychosis? It is wrong. Well, what happens is uh, we need to refine those laws because otherwise you can't get the history. If you cannot get the history, for psychiatric psychological disorder, you cannot diagnose it, you cannot treat it. It is akin to telling an orthopedic surgeon, we want you to diagnose whether or not this person has any fractures in their bones, but we're not going to let you look at any x-rays. Well, we have to stop that. We have to understand that we have to provide some access to information when it's needed, yet still protect confidentiality and follow all the ethical rules of every profession. We also found that there's this imminent danger standard, which has quite frankly existed since the 1700s. And this is the standard that says the person has to be in imminent danger to themselves or someone else. And then you can, without their authority, um, put them in um, inpatient care against their will. Again, this standard is to this level that someone has to be basically slitting their wrists, overdosing on drugs, holding a gun or a knife to someone else's throat before we believe they need help. Do we do that with any other medical illness? Do we wait for someone to say, I can't really treat you until your cancer has advanced to stage four? I can't really treat your chest pains until you're unconscious from a heart attack? I can't deal with your cardiovascular problems until you have a stroke and things have burst? No. But somehow we have this, this things with, with psychiatric illnesses that we have to wait till the person has completely deteriorated before we do something. We need to step in and help them because that is a more optimistic and a better prognosis in assisting them. It's also important that we have evidence-based treatments that really work. There are treatments out there, several of them out there, but what happens is we see a lot of uh, federal dollars and state dollars going towards programs. There's more, 
along the lines of, quite frankly, many elected officials saying, let's just fund this and put it away. Nobody wants to deal with this problem. People don't want to talk about it. America's big secret. And so we say, let's just fund these programs. And no one asks the question of all these federal and state dollars, does it work? In some cases, quite frankly, they don't work. Some of the money is spent on silly things which would make your blood boil as a taxpayer. Why is it that federal dollars go to pay for a conference where literally the topics are such things as interpretive dancing, stopping to take your, to stop taking your medication, making a collage, getting in touch with your inner animal? No. You want to go to some weekend workshop for things like that, pay for it out of your own pocket. But when we see millions of dollars going towards those, those things and telling people we don't have enough people to provide help for you, that is wrong. And we're not going to put up with that anymore. And there's a, that what, it goes to this point of weak accountability for federal dollars. And we're going to change that. So what does this bill do? First of all, we empower parents and caregivers with making a very clear definition, refining the definitions of what the HIPAA and FERPA laws are so that providers and, and family members clearly know this doesn't mean that someone who has no relationship at all or a family member who has been disjointed from uh, uh, the, the, the patient can suddenly come in and get lots of information. No. We want those standards to be clearly defined. So this is a very important tweak. Uh, we want them to have access to history when they need it. We would also uh, fix much of the shortage in inpatient beds. Right now, there's a 16-bed rule. Don't know how that ever came about. How do we figure out that we're not going to reimburse you if you have 17 or 18 or 19 beds? You have to have 16. When most states, 48 states, have a critical bed shortage, this has to change. So we boost the number of beds allowed to get a Medicaid payment. We also want to make sure there's uh, alternatives to institutionalization. Why should it only be the jail, homelessness, or, um, or, or being in a long-term inpatient facility is enough? Assisted outpatient treatment has been found to be extremely effective in states that do this. Now, a lot of states have this on the books, some like 44 states, but very few states do it. New York is an example of doing it right, where they have found when they, instead of putting people uh, in uh, the 302 procedure is what we call in Pennsylvania, but basically in an involuntary commitment. In New York, where uh, things work with the family members or uh, with the district attorney, work with the judge, and come up with an agreement with the patient to stay on your medication, stay in treatment. What they found is that the cost for related medical care and social services and imprisonment fell 46% overall. But in many of these, those areas, it's much higher, quite frankly, in some areas exceeding 80% or so for people going into jail. Um, uh, or being uh, homeless. The other I the issue is it uh, encourages states to adopt a need for treatment standard instead of just waiting until someone is going to kill somebody else or themselves. We look at a need for treatment as a standard. The next item, it, it reaches patients beyond just the emergency room. Um, the um, CMS recently came up with a ruling that they were going to limit the type of medications available for someone with psychiatric illnesses. We had a uh, rather emotional packed hearing a few days ago on this, uh, where a representative from CMS was there to tell us they were going to limit the type of drugs that were available. Now, I had to read out loud a statement from the American Psychiatric Association, which clearly said that CMS distorted their analysis of this when they said you can't have certain psychiatric drugs. And in that, one of the comments that was made was about SSRIs. And I said, can you tell me what an SSRI is? And his response was, I wasn't briefed on that. Now, if you don't even know what you're talking about, it's pretty clear that you're going to draw conclusions that have nothing to do with reality. And I'm understating my, my concern for the decision that was made. And I pointed out that uh, they have a, another a standard within that that says that if you're not rehospitalized within seven days, it's OK to, to change this. Now, I'm not talking about two equivalent generic drugs, but they were limiting the, the type of drug so severely that I thought it was going to greatly impair a physician's ability to prescribe appropriate medication. Now, I added to this when you're over age 65, for example, uh, and you receive a diagnosis of chronic illness, you're twice as likely to be facing depression. And those who are depressed and chronically ill, you double, double your health care costs for lots of different reasons of exacerbation of physical symptoms, uh, less likelihood to comply with other treatments. So I reminded him that when seniors commit suicide, 20% um, of them do it the day of their doctor visit, the day of their doctor visit, 40% the week of their doctor visit, and 70% within a month of their last doctor visit. So recognizing that many of these antidepressant drugs, et cetera, take two to six weeks to become effective. 
to tie a physician's hands and say, you can't use this drug until you've tried other ones and they failed, puts that patient's life at risk. And I'm happy to say that a couple of weeks after, or a, week, a few days after that hearing, CMS reversed their decision. But this bill would say, we're not going to leave it up to the whims of whoever is sitting in that chair. We're going to make that part of the law. Uh, the same-day billing issue is also quite important that uh, a doc you can't have two doctor bills on the same day. We know that a family is most likely and a person is more likely to go to a pediatrician, their family physician, their internist to seek assistance when they're beginning to exhibit um, some severe mental illness. We know that the average is 112 weeks before a person has their first visit to treat mental illness. But what happens is if, uh, if a mother's bringing her teenage son, again, 14 to 25 is the age that most severe mental illness symptoms begin to exhibit, bring their, their teenage son to a doctor, and the doctor says, you know, I'm very concerned about the things your, your son is saying and doing right now. We need him to see a psychiatrist or psychologist now. Oh, that's right, you're on Medicaid. Can you come back tomorrow? That's inhumane. And we're not going to have that anymore. We're going to say in these cases, there needs to be an allowance for same-day billing. Also, more access to telepsychiatry, a program like the Child Psychiatry Access Project, where uh, physicians can't access by calling a number uh, or allow more telepsychiatry since we have a shortage. We know this is a very effective mechanism to do this, to have a mental health professional be able to talk to the patient on a video screen, uh, but it's some billing barriers we have to eliminate. We know that medical research is important, so we authorize the BRAIN Initiative, extremely important program for NIH to involve a lot of research on the brain, that last frontier of the human body, and the RAISE Initiative, the response after initial schizophrenic episode, a very effective program for early intervention for these uh, problems. Uh, we also want to integrate mental health and primary care for the methods, for the reasons I said before about that's where the first appointments tend to take place. But part of this is um, the bill that uh, Senator Stabenow and Blunt uh, I had put into the SGR bill, which was passed yesterday. Um, I had also put in some uh, funding in there, which was approved yesterday in the House bill. I'm sure the Senate will do that too. Another $60 million to go towards uh, helping with assisted outpatient treatment programs. It's a cause for celebration that those things are out there. More behavior, behavioral health uh, IT, that is medical records, are moving to, uh, into the 21st century where they are uh, electronic medical records. but not for behavioral medicine. And why would that be? We have to have an integrated care model where the brain's function are seen as part of the body and not distant from. Uh, not something you put in jail, not something you call the police for, not something you kick out of your office because you don't want to deal with it. What the brain does is part of the rest of the body, and so behavioral health records also need to be in there so physicians can work as a team. Um, another part of this bill is through our community health centers is to allow um, mental health professionals and physicians to volunteer. Now here's another thing that's so absurd, only the federal government could come up with this. If you work in a community health center, and by the way, these are marvelous places to provide low cost services to underserved areas, rural and urban. If you work in one of these places, you're covered by the Federal Torts Claims Act, so malpractice insurance is low, uh, and they can provide a lot of integrated care, because the nice thing about this, there'll be uh, physicians and podiatrists and dentists and nurses and nurse practitioners uh, and psychologists, social workers, all working together. Great, that's what you want, to provide this team access. But unfortunately, a lot of them are understaffed. Now, if you are employed there, you are covered by this. If you are at a free clinic and you volunteer there, you're covered by the Federal Torts Claim Act. But if it's a community health center and you volunteer, you're not covered. Or if you're at a free clinic and you're paid, you're not covered. So we're thinking, wait a minute. There have been a number of studies that say that people will give of their time uh, to work at these centers. Uh, an afternoon a week, uh, a day a month can be very, very valuable in providing for some assisted care. So we're going to take away that barrier and allow people to be um, uh, be the good Samaritans, want to help out, give of their time. Uh, and, um, and quite frankly, this is probably going to be about a billion dollars worth of free care every year in this country at least. Next is in Department of Justice reforms, what I described before about prisons. Unfortunately, a lot of that is guesstimates, and perhaps some of our other panelists can talk about this today. Um, but still, we don't know a lot of what happens in the federal justice system. We want to know what happens with serious mental illness, the treatments. Um, the, there's, it's a disjointed model. They may have some care or not before they go into jail. They may have a different kind of care in jail. And once they go out, we don't know if they have follow-up care. We want to make sure we're tracking that rather than wait to the next arrest. 
The teen behavioral health awareness is extremely important to also help teens be educated and understand that uh, serious mental illness, uh, what the symptoms are and how they can seek treatment so they're not afraid of it. And drive evidence-based care through an assistant secretary of mental health, mental health. This is extremely important. Of all this money the federal government spends, there's nobody who looks after what happens at Department of Defense, Department of Veterans Affairs, Department of Justice, Department of Education, Department of Health and Human Services, and maybe even Department of Labor, Transportation, or who knows where else. But a lot of money is spent throughout the federal government in prevention and treatment services for mental illness. And as I said, a lot of it is not evidence-based care. DOD has done some marvelous things. I also serve in the Navy. Uh, currently, I work as a Navy psychologist at Walter Reed Hospital. And I know uh, throughout the military, we've done a number of tremendous initiatives to try and create more care for our active duty and reservists and guardsmen out there um, serving our nation. But there's this big disjointed thing between that and also the Veterans Affairs System. Someone in VA saw a study about 20% of people who contact the VA for post-traumatic stress disorder, 20% get appropriate help, 20%. Uh, waiting lists or people uh, seeing their initial treatments as group therapy or giving medications, they come back in a couple months, it's not good treatment. Um, we want an assistant secretary of mental health specifically designed as a uh, physician psychiatrist or clinical psychologist to say this person's job is to go through every nook and cranny of the federal government, find every dollar and say, is it evidence-based care? Does it make sense? Is there a scientific standard for it? If not, eliminate it. It's duplicative, merge it. Uh, if it's great, expand it. Help gather information from states. Uh, and I hope Patrick talks about this too. The mental health parity bill that he worked on, incredible thing. It was an honor to work with him on this. But how we can make states are doing uh, these things too, and I think is an essential part of what this assistant secretary can be doing to move forward. So this is what this bill does. It is very comprehensive. It's not something I can just explain in a, in a thumbnail sketch. But quite frankly, uh, there's three things that I think have happened in the last 50, 60 years in this nation to change mental health. One is the changes that President Kennedy made uh, with regard to how we need to close down our asylums and, sh and stop just warehousing people, uh, but move towards real change. But some of those things have withered away and we need to beef them up. Two is the things that uh, former Congressman Patrick Kennedy did uh, in office to make sure we had mental health parity. But three, these other reforms still need to happen. This is the headline that should be in our newspapers, that the federal government finally stood up and made some reforms and re re changed these barriers. I don't want to see, none of us want to see any more headlines of another tragedy, of a victimization of a person with mental illness, or a violence committed by a person with mental illness. Let's bring this issue out of the shadows and make some significant changes and help our country move forward. Thank you very much. Now we turn to Dr. Lieberman. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, in conclusion, I'd like to thank. Um, so uh, I've spent my career, or most of my career, really being a pointy headed scientist in the laboratory doing research on the psychopharmacology and neurobiology of schizophrenia but always acting as a clinician, treating patients as well. And then in the past maybe a decade, I, as chair of the largest mental health care provider in metropolitan New York area, and uh, then as president of the APA, have gotten drawn into the kind of legislative political dimension uh, of things. And um, it's been uh, an interesting but uh, sobering experience. Um, and uh, when Sally called me to participate in this event. I noted that it was smack in the middle of a vacation that I take every year to go to Key Biscayne, Florida and watch the Sony Tennis Open. And uh, I said, after thinking about it and hearing who was going to be here, and particularly as Congressman Murphy's legislative initiatives have gained momentum, you know, I'm going to come. So I missed Roger Federer playing yesterday. and <laughs> but. It was for, for good reason, because this is an opportunity at a time that can really be, I know it's a cliche, but sort of a tipping point or, or a turning point. Um, we're here today on an issue that's been in front of us for decades, if not more, 
and many people have been talking about it, indeed railing about it, including my good friend and colleague Fuller Torrey, uh, but it didn't resonate as fully. Um, but we're here today because an individual like Congressman Murphy has stepped forward to assume uh, not just a leadership role, but a role which is really doing something important and meaningful. Um, now, he's not alone in doing this. You know, there have been champions for mental health in Congress previously, Senator Pete Domenici, Arlen Specter, Paul Wellstone, um, Gordon Smith, John Porter, uh, Patrick Kennedy, and his colleague Jim Ramstead, and his father, Senator Edward Kennedy. Uh, but as time goes on, they move on, and uh, we're not sure who is going to sort of follow in their place. And Congressman Murphy has stepped forward to do so, along with other individuals who are so uh, uh, gratefully sort of working in this way, uh, such as uh, Senator Stabenow and uh, your, your co-chairperson. Well, on, uh, in Colorado, uh, DeGette, yeah. right, and the Neuroscience Caucus and so forth. Um, so we really have a chance to do something now given the fact that an individual who has vision and courage is in a position, a platform, is stepping forward to doing so. Um, I have some slides. Can you able to get those up? As a researcher, you can't talk without having slides for too long. Uh, so I thought I'd put those up just so you could follow along. Um, but it's not going to be easy. The reason is because, yep, the reason is because um, our system of care, which is admittedly fragmented, inefficient, and expensive, really is trying to address at least three distinct populations, or populations defined by illness, type of illness, severity, and also venue of treatment. Um, the one that we hear most about, and is indeed probably the most urgent priority, are the serious and persistently mental, these are people with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, recurrent major psychotic depression, and um, <clears throat> uh, they are treated largely in uh, mental health care facilities, outside of medical facilities. Um, then we have the people who are receiving medical and surgical services who have comorbid psychiatric illnesses, and this proportion of the healthcare population is one of the biggest cost drivers in overall cost of care. And then we have a third group, which is individuals who have milder forms of mental illness or the so-called worried well or uh, working addictions that are treated in clinics, practice settings, and so forth. So we have three distinct groups. And we talk about mental health care and mental illness we're all talking about slightly different emphases on these different populations or uh, settings where people are receiving care. Now, we, we, we have opportunities and there is a obvious need to, in addressing the needs of these populations, do several things. One of them, which has become the new buzzword, is collaborative or integrated care. And what that means simply is psychiatry, Mental health care needs to be embedded in the primary care system. There can't be separate places. It has to be embedded, just like journalists go to war and get embedded. Mental health care providers need to be embedded. Similarly, primary care providers, if psychiatrists don't take on general medical care as a new part of their responsibility, um, primary care doctors need to be, or primary care professionals need to be embedded in the clinics that are treating the SPMI populations. That's a no-brainer. Um, we have huge benefits. The second thing is, is if we really want to get serious with this, and this is the next thing that we're going to try and uh, push Congressman Murphy on, is we need a public health initiative for mental health care. Just like you have hypertension screening, diabetes screening, TB screening. Now, it's not going to be as easy, but there needs to be mental health efforts that move out of clinical settings into the community, whether it's in primary care, the educational system, the workplace, uh, faith-based organizations. Um, 
that's where mental health care needs to move also as a sort of a, a new frontier. Um, <clears throat> now, mental health care and psychiatry has historically been a, a kind of a stepchild of medicine and of health care. Um, there's reasons for that, but apart from those for the time being, um, it's something that the government has seen fit to need to step in and uh, do something about because people with mental illness weren't taken care of in ordinary ways in which people had their health taken care of. So the government had to step in. Now, it largely has fallen to the state or local governments, state mental health systems. You don't have a state health system. You have a state mental health system. Why? Because the, nobody else is providing mental health care. So it fell to the state and the local governments. The federal government's initiative came as Fuller, I don't know if you're going to talk about it, but his book, American Psychosis, you know, brilliantly depicts the kind of shameful trajectory of the federal government's effort to try and take on mental health care. But when it began, you know, post-World War II, it started, it had a vision with President Kennedy's Community Mental Health Act, and then it kind of failed miserably and we're sort of struggling to recover from it then. But the recognition that mental health was somewhat different for a variety of reasons and needed some kind of special attention, and that's st still the case. Um, in addition, yep, uh, our challenges are obvious. Um, Congressman Murphy has mentioned to it, everybody is well aware of the fragmentation. The tips of the iceberg of the neglect and the failed mental health policy are seen innumerably. You know, the tragic mass violent incidents is one way that gets the most attention, but it's the jails that are 30 to 40 percent, it's the homeless that are 30, 40 percent. It is the cost of care that's uh, driving up the percentage of the GDP that's spent on health care that's in part driven by, by this. Um, but we have opportunities here, and these are not just sort of more of the same type of opportunities. We have a convergence of things that is going on. Um, the truth be told, one of the reasons that people have stigma associated with mental illness in psychiatry is because um, there's, well, stigma basically it can be deconstructed to discrimination on one hand and mistrust or suspicion on the other. And um, they had reasons to mistrust psychiatry and mental health care. We didn't have that much to offer. But now we do. As Congressman Murphy says, there are evidence-based treatments. The science of the brain is the new science. And it has given mental health and psychiatry attraction it never had before. Combined with this is the legislative initiatives that are really uh, being pushed forward. And also, the, even though it's not perfect, the increased social awareness. So we have a real opportunity here that historically has not occurred, and we need to take full advantage of it. And finally, let me say that as we move on, as we move on, um, I think what will happen is that as, and Patrick is really passionate about this, is that people who were involved in mental health care on the provider side, on the uh, policy side, and even on the stakeholder uh, uh, consumer advocacy side, need to put aside their parochial interests. And they realize that this is not anybody's sort of life, we're not, we're not competing for market share. And we're not competing so we get you know, the largest proportion and the other group doesn't. Um, this is a, an effort. What is the optimal model to deliver care? What are the roles that the people at different levels of training should play in that? How do we configure it in the context of services that are distributed into different venues or settings where care is provided? And then how do we compensate? How do we finance that? What are the reimbursement schemes for that? So these are knowable things. I mean, we don't have to find a gene or do an experiment or have a breakthrough drug to have a huge impact. And this is the way it can be orchestrated. So I, I'm feeling, uh, and I'm usually not sort of a, a you know, rosy pink glasses type of guy, I'm feeling that even though the challenges are very significant, we have a, a historic opportunity. And no matter how much we know or think we can do, it's only going to work if we can really orchestrate the political process in an effective way. Thank you. So much. Representative Kennedy. Thank you very much, Sally. And, uh, and thank you so much for your leadership. Uh, I've gotten a little uh, wary of not having to turn on microphones for three years since I've been out of Congress. So. 
excuse me for being a little rusty here. Um, I really am honored to be here with you, Tim. And I am so thrilled that you are amassing the kind of energy that needs to be placed in this area and to try to get the federal government to, to pay attention to how do we move forward effectively. And uh, I just want to say to all of you, I'm honored to be here with all of you. It's the AEI, and I'm a liberal Democrat. But mental health knows no partisanship. As has been uh, stated before, uh, my dad and I were the principal sponsors of Mental Health Parity. Uh, in 2008, George W. Bush signed into law, and it couldn't have been done without Pete Domenici and many, many others. So in this town today, we're polarized by ideology. But this is one area where we can put our ideology aside and understand that there's still going to be those with ideology on either side, but that the, the large majority of us can work together to find common ground. So I'll use kind of a, a metaphor to kind of explain what Jeff's been trying to explain in his academic and medical lingo. Um, he talked about the tip of the iceberg. So we have the Titanic, and we are taking on water. And now we're trying to think of how do we avoid hitting the iceberg again. Well, we could build more lifeboats to take care of all the people that are going to be displaced because of this disastrous system that we have in place. Or we could steer clear of the iceberg. What a thought. Um, in other words, the answer, in my view, to the severe and persistently mentally ill is not only to treat them, but to prevent people from coming, becoming severe and persistently mentally ill. To liken it to diabetes, we're all about discussing how to conduct more amputations, as opposed to getting people the kind of primary care that will catch their being, you know, early candidates for diabetes and treating them aggressively early on so that they never have to develop those symptoms that necessitate, necessitate such draconian responses. So I appreciate the fact that so many people after the lack of follow-through on President Kennedy's, I think, correct vision. Prevention is what he talked about. He talked about doing more research so we could come up with better therapies. And, and he talked about community-based care, because at the end of the day, people want to live with their families and in their community, not in institutions. But to get there, we never, as in Washington, that famous term, follow the money, the money never went from the institutions to provide the needed care in the community. So if you look at the most successful AOT experiment in the country in New York, Kendra's Law, what makes it so successful is that there are the funding mechanisms to support people in their community. And so in other words, there is no kind of quick fix here is what I'm trying to say. We need a a comprehensive approach, but what we ultimately need to do is tell the American people what we're talking about here. And we're not talking about mental health. We're talking about treating every American the way we would treat them if they had cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, asthma, any other illness. If we truly change our mindset as a nation and think about this in the same way we would any other health care, a lot of these problems go away. Why? Because we'll start paying for them. I'm on Lipitor. I've been on Lipitor for 15 years. Are you kidding me? Why are they worried about me having a stroke in my 60s? I'm in, I was in my 30s when I was first put on Lipitor. Why aren't we taking that same mentality in terms of mental health? Now, you look at my face, you know I'm going to have skin cancer because I've already had it. And so they say, when have you been at the dermatologist recently? I'm like, okay, you got me. Like Jeff was talking about screening, I call it a checkup from the neck up. Why don't we have every physician's visit include a checkup from the neck up? 
You talk about changing perceptions and ideas so that mental health isn't something you have to go down the hall to, you know, drink from the colored water fountain. Because no one wants that separate but not so equal system of care. Because that's what mental health is today. It's the separate but unequal system. We want mental health as part of overall health care. And the last thing I'll say is I think the way to, for us to achieve this, as Tim has been doing and trying to put together this bill, is to monitor the federal government's implementation of the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act such that Centers of Medicare and Medicaid are going to have more say than SAMHSA ever will on where the dollars in mental health are going to go. I'd like to see them follow the federal law. Imagine the federal government having to follow their own law. Two, if, if Department of Labor is going to oversee ERISA plans because over half the health care in this country is being delivered in the private sector, why not have a better uh, monitoring, or as Tim's been emphasizing throughout his bill, clarity in ensuring that you know, they treat the, quote, invisible wounds of war of our returning soldiers the same way we would treat their visible wounds. Because both are killing them. And fr quite frankly today, the invisible wounds are costing our more soldiers' lives than the visible ones. So my view is, this is all about framing the issue. And uh, I appreciate the work that everyone is doing in this field to try to do that. And I think, as Tim has pointed out, this is a very important time in the history of this movement to get it right. Uh, because there's a lot on the line, none the least of which is our returning heroes, who are not only going to use the public system, they're also going to be employees in our Fortune 100, 500, and small business companies all across this country. So we better get it right, not only for those of us who have a, a mental illness like myself or an addiction like myself, but for our returning heroes. So uh, I'm glad to be here and look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Sally. And Dr. Fuller Torrey. Thank you very much, Sally, and thank you to AEI for sponsoring this. Uh, I will honestly say it's, a, it's an honor to be here and to support Representative Murphy on his bill on it. I have been following this for over 40 years in Washington, and during that time, the problems have gotten progressively worse. Uh, it's an equal opportunity disaster. We've had, since 1963, the passage of the CMHC bill. We have had the five Republican, five Democrat presidents no president has understood the problem. Uh, these are brain diseases we're talking about, and so really nothing has been done. We had two presidential commissions. Really nothing important came out of either one. We've had at any given time 15 to 25 members of Congress who had severely mentally ill people in their family. Uh, we have had things like the insurance parity, as uh, Representative Kennedy mentioned, and Pete Domenici worked very hard on. Parity did a lot for a lot of people, but it did very little for people with severe mental illnesses on it. Representative Murphy is the first member of Congress in the 44 years I have followed this to take on serious mental illness and try to propose serious solutions to this. And I think we're all very obligated to him for that. But is it a difficult problem? Uh, you bet it will be. He mentioned that there are 3.5 million untreated people with severe mental illness today. That is the same as the population of San Francisco and Oakland put together. It's the same as the population of Minneapolis and St. Paul put together. Uh, these, these are not just numbers. These are people on it. There is an acute shortage of psychiatric beds. None of us are saying we need to go back to where we were in 1958 when we had 340 beds per 100,000 people. We now have 11 beds, public psychiatric beds per 100,000 people on it. Uh, we have effectively closed one million public psychiatric bed state hospitals. Uh, if you project on the same number of people per population as we had in 1950. So there's one million people who a year ago, I'm sorry, who uh, half a century ago would have been in psychiatric hospitals. Where are they now? A week from Tuesday, we'll be releasing a new report from the Treatment Advocacy Center on the number of mentally ill people in jails and prisons, state prisons and jails. The number, as best we can tell, and I think it's conservative, is about 350,000. 
What we have left in the state hospitals is we have 35,000. So we now have 10 times more people with severe mental illness in our prisons and jails than we have in the mental hospitals on it. Homeless, we've got at least 200,000 homeless. And again, that's a conservative number. Uh, so you have 350,000 people who are in jails and prisons, 200,000 homeless. Representative Murphy had hearings on Wednesday, very good hearings, in terms of asking where have all these people gone? Well, there's 600,000 of them right there. That's where they've gone on it, and that's where they are. And I think it's important, that these are not just numbers, these are people. These are people who have mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters. I get a printout every day of the reports from around the United States on what's going on. Uh, last week, Seth Boyer was on it, 36 years old, college graduate, homeless, refused to take his medicine, probably is unaware of his illness, told his parents that he sometimes slept in trash bins, this is in Lawrence, Kansas, on it, and he was found dead, compacted in a trash bin where he'd been picked up on it. Uh, these are tragedies that happen every day on it. We have about 10% of our 13,000 homicides a year that are committed by people with severe untreated mental illness on it. About 50% of the mass killings, Tucson, Aurora, and Newtown, are committed by people with severe mental illness who are untreated. Our emergency rooms are now overrun in terms of where those other 400,000 people are. I think most of them are in the emergency rooms waiting for a bed on it. Uh, it is a huge problem in the emergency rooms and it's getting worse every time I see it. Last year in Anderson, South Carolina, a man with severe mental illness was stuck in the emergency room for 36 days waiting for a bed. Now, until recently, we thought 36 hours was a long time to wait for a bed. We're now up to 36 days. You know, are we going to go to 36 months? At what point will we really start to try and turn this around? Is I think that's what Representative Murphy wants to do. Police and sheriffs are overwhelmed with the number of severely mentally ill Increase in the number of what we call justifiable homicides. The report we issued last year from the Treatment Advocacy Center su suggests that the data, about half of the people who are killed by sheriffs and police are severely mentally ill. Some of them are suicide by cop. This is also getting worse. Individuals with untreated severe mental illness have taken over many of the public spaces, parks, playgrounds, bus, shell, bus stations, etc. We did a survey of librarians a few years ago 28% in 28% of the libraries, a staff member had been assaulted by a mentally ill patron on it. Uh, many of the public libraries have become day programs for the severely mentally ill on it. The other thing that has amazed me over the years, and because I kind of follow the politics of this town, is this is a hugely expensive problem that I don't always expect the Democrats to pay too much attention to this, but I do expect the conservatives to pay more attention to this, and yet almost nobody has picked it up. The federal Medicaid, Medicare, SSI, and DI are among the most rapidly growing segments of the federal budget. For Medicaid, for example, people with mental illness are 11% of the beneficiaries, but they represent 30% of the costs. For SSDI, SSDI tripled between 1980 in 2010, 28% have a psychiatric diagnosis. As a recent publication said, they are the largest and fastest growing group of SSDI beneficiaries on it. The problem is huge. It's costly both in terms of human lives and it's costly also in terms of dollars on it. And I think what Representative Murphy has proposed is a very good start. It's not gonna solve everything, obviously, but it's a very good start. He hits many different areas on it. The need for treatment standard, the demonstration funds for AOT, those of us who don't know what AOT is, assisted outpatient treatment, that means that you can live in the community as long as you take your medicine because number one, we know you have anisognosia, you don't know that you're sick, which is two of about 50% of schizophrenia and bipolar with psychotic features. And number two, we know you have been dangerous. And let me stress that only a small number of people need to be on AOT, probably about 1% of the severely mentally ill. But those who need to be on it really need to be on it, and it is marvelously uh, a functioning, uh, effective on it. Uh, five states have shown that it decreases hospital admissions. Studies in New York and North Carolina have shown that it decreases arrests and incarceration, decreases homelessness, decreases episodes of violence, and it decreases costs 
study coming out in psychiatric services this month in Florida showed that when you keep people on medication, you decrease the costs on it. Again, we're not talking of a large number of people who need it. This is one of the, I think, the most important things that Representative Murphy has in his bill is demonstration projects for AOT. And I think it's going to very, become very clear how important this has been on it. Uh, refocusing SAMHSA. SAMHSA is probably the least functional government agency, and in Washington, that's saying a lot. Uh, I've been around for 40 years, and I'm constantly amazed at uh, how dysfunctional some of the federal agencies are. Um, and I think SAMHSA is in a class all by itself. This bill attempts to bring them into the 21st century. Uh, whether it will work or not, I'm not sure, but it's certainly worth a try on it. Finally, increases the role of NIMH. Dr. Insull is one of the few people in Washington who really understands this problem and has put the best leadership of NIMH we have had to date. And I think anything we can do to get him more involved in this problem. Finally, let me just thank Representative Murphy for taking this on. I think we're all obligated to him, and I think what he's doing is very important and deserves all of our support. Thank you. Okay, uh, now we have, God, we have a good amount of time for Q&A. So we have two folks going around with uh, microphones. And uh, one thing I'll mention, you may have, uh, Mr. Murphy just went through a, uh, you know, a tour de force of his bill, but one of the many important elements I think is also the, the provision that works, that would work with the criminal justice system to educate law enforcement and sheriffs about mental illness and how to how to manage these folks into the treatment system and not into the criminal justice system. Too often, these are the frontline professionals. And in the case of that Navy, the Washington Navy Yard shooting, may have made, in retrospect, everything is 2020, of course, but may have made the big, the fatal difference in in his case. Uh, when they visited him in the hotel room and didn't quite manage it as well as they might have. Uh, anyway, it, it's a very important aspect of the bill. I'm sorry, there were hands? And now we can, uh, okay. Gentleman in the red tie. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, I share your illness. I, too, am a Democrat. Um, oh. um, <laughs> DJ, want to say who your name and your oh, affiliation? Sorry. I'm yeah. DJ Jaffe. I'm with Mental Illness Policy Org. And I'm a hardcore Democrat, but I have found on the issues of the seriously mentally ill that the Republican Party is a lot better, and Mr. Murphy in particular. My own party is willing to throw money at mental health, but is unwilling to admit the politically incorrect things that need to be done to help the most seriously ill. And in your presentation, for instance, you talked about prevention. There is no way to prevent schizophrenia or bipolar. We don't know how to do that. You talked about early intervention. We don't know how to identify someone with schizophrenia before they come up with the symptoms, working on it, but we don't know how. Um, you talked about ERISA. I can count on one hand the number of people with schizophrenia who have non-subsidized employment outside the mental health or arts field. So what is it about serious mental illness that my own party won't address? Um, well, again, not to get polarizing here, because the one thing we cannot afford to do in our field is to not work together when we have more in common than we have that separates us here. Um, I think we absolutely need to do more, and that's why I've been talking to Tim on this legislation. I think identifying the real elephant in the room, and I'm not talking about my Republican colleagues, but the fact that there is a problem of reinstitutionalization, as Tim pointed out, in our, in our emergency rooms and in our prisons. Um, but I think for us to retreat from the notion that the RAISE program, which I salute Tim for highlighting in his legislation, <clears throat> I think as Fuller talked about Tom Insel's work on the Naples project, the notion that we can't do early intervention, if you intervene on first instance of psychosis, you can dramatically reduce the pathology of that illness if you intervene early. Everybody knows that. 
So to say that we're not going to put in place a system of care that responds to you with mental illness the same way we would, like I pointed out, with diabetes. Because the way we treat mental illness today is we wait till you have to get the amputation. We do not pay. We say if you have cancer, we wouldn't imagine saying to someone, come back when you have stage four cancer. But that's how we reimburse mental illness today. So I'm saying if you, we're in a historic time of, re, as they say, re-incentivizing the payment. So if we start paying for these primary and secondary levels of care, my contention is you're not going to have as many tertiary levels of care. So I, and, I, and what I want to say about this politically is I don't think we're irreconcilable here. I think we have to deal with the severe and persistently mentally ill, but we also have to reorient the system so that we don't create so many of them. And I think in this day and age, we're at a moment in time to change the system so that while we're treating those people who are so sick, we're also preventing others from ending up in that situation. And I agree with you. Is there a vacuum of leadership? You bet. But that's what we're here to discuss is what to do about putting that leadership back in, in Washington, D.C. on these issues. Let me comment on that first. And uh, thanks so much for your support of this bill. <clears throat> Ronald Reagan, I'm not sure what he was referring to at the time, but if I can apply his quote here, it says, this isn't an issue of the left or the right. It's the question of do we move forward or back. And that's where it really comes down to. And that I, I've not seen any division among my colleagues of either side of the aisle on dealing with these issues. And uh, I think what drew Patrick and I together in a friendship has been our common desire to do something here. <clears throat> but there is a divide in a couple issues. And, and Foley, you probably know this history better than I. But uh, when it was back in the 60s, when Reagan was the governor of um, California in the yeah. 70s. And there was a move at that time to close a lot of hospitals in California. And so you had two groups. You had one group saying, well, we can't have these hospitals there because that would be like the Russian gulags where we put our people we don't want to talk to and we hide them in these psychiatric hospitals. That was coming from one fringe. Another fringe was saying, we're putting people there against their will and we're not allowing them to have their rights, et cetera. And so here you had this imperfect storm that moved in California to shut the hospital systems down. And still what remains are some groups to talk about the rights of patients. Now, I think patients, I think people have a right to get well. And this is where this often gets grossly misinterpreted from people who will say, well, we, this person should have the ability to refuse treatment. Look, I understand that sometimes people are there with late, late stage camps and they, and they say, look, it's, it's time. But when someone is not even well, and they can't even make a decision. They don't even know what planet they're on or who they are. How do we suddenly say they're going to make a decision? As former psychiatrist Charles Crownham refers to it, we have them die with their rights on. Mm -hmm. uh, during our hearings this week, we had uh, really impassioned uh, comments from someone who runs a Georgetown Homeless Center in Washington, D.C., and he says most of the homeless he deals with have no idea they have mental illness, that anosognosia, which uh, Dr. Torrey referred to. So we have to talk about let's have the people the right to get better and the rights to treatment instead of arguing, well, they can go ahead and refuse treatment if they want. I want them to get better. Let them have this incredible option to feel healthy because the stigma that comes with mental illness is the idea that can't be treated. I mean, they think that, uh, you know, we show them uh, ink blots, uh, give them drugs, and, and then sit on the couch and talk about their relationship with their mother. That doesn't happen. What we do is really get them real treatment and help make them better, and that's where then we can have people talk about the right to go back to work, the right to live independently, the right to say hello to a policeman instead of hearing the policeman say you're under arrest. What a wonderful option that is. And what Patrick says is so on target. We can do this early. We don't have to wait till the crisis occurs. And Tim, just that point. If you treat someone early, you don't have to use as much medication, which be is the thing that really, for people who are consumers, really unnerves them. It's the, the level of the side effects. You treat this early, you're not going to have this need the same levels because you're not going to have waited for the illness to pathologize. And my point is then there might be greater compliance. So you're not going to have to tell them through a court order you've got to take this. They're going to be able to live and understand this is, 
it, well within their ability to integrate into their livelihoods. And if we've got them on our side, believe me, you're going to have much better results in the long term than if we're trying to have this government micromanage people with mental illness. Next question. Next question. Next question. Um, yes, this gentleman. Linwood Bregan with Capstan Council for Policy and Ethics. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sattel and all the panel. But uh, question, uh, Dr. Murphy, as a uh, naval medical officer with our armed forces, uh, including massive numbers of Guard and Reserve units that are standing down after 13 years of continuous redeployments in these wars that they've been in, would you address, please, uh, the necessity for more varied and out-of-the-box effective treatments uh, but also a cultural imperative to eliminate stigma that can be attached to post-traumatic stress disorder as we've got these units coming back home and as they're going to need to decompress and reintegrate into civilian society to do exactly what uh, your colleague, Congressman Kennedy, was saying, treat it early, treat it effectively so that these folks don't wind up going full-blown into the system. And, you know, it helps our economy, helps the entire society. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I say, sir, because now I'm putting my Navy hat on. Uh, I am not authorized to make statements on behalf of the Department of Defense, but let me describe what I see here uh, as lieutenant commander in the work that I do with PTSD and TBI, traumatic brain injury patients. That um, there has been a, a long stigma among armed services members against seeking treatment. They saw it as something that would lead to um, uh, loss of rank, loss of opportunities to, uh, to grow uh, in the military. Um, sometimes discharges, et cetera. So they were afraid to talk. They thought that their um, non-commissioned and commissioned officers would not put them into battle or, or would give them bad write-ups. What we have found is with uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and post-traumatic stress, another anxiety related, it is identifiable, you can diagnose, you can treat it. Um, but we have to remove that internal stigma. Now, many generals and admirals have done a lot of work on this, helping uh, people un understand they can get help, but a lot of this needs to go to the level of the non-commissioned officers, the sergeants and the chiefs. Um, the best thing I heard from a patient I was seeing at Walter Reed Hospital, uh, a Marine was, I was asking him about some of his symptoms after he had been in the hospital, we had a number of wounds, but dealing with uh, some of the mental aspects of this too. And he said a fascinating thing. He said his gunny office, his gunny sergeant, uh, Marine gunny sergeant, had told, would tell him almost every day, look, if you have a twisted ankle and you're going outside the wire with us and you don't tell us, you slow us down, you're going to get somebody killed. So speak up. Similarly, if you got a twisted brain that day and you're going to get somebody killed, speak up. We'll get both of them fixed and you get back out there, you know, back in the saddle and moving forward. That is the kind of attitude we need. Now, what happens is, um, I don't think there's enough providers within the, the Department of Defense. Uh, I don't think we have enough providers who have more experience. Very often, they're uh, young folks out of medical school and uh, residencies and, and uh, psychological programs. They're great providers. I mean, these are f incredibly dedicated people led by some great uh, officers, too. But there's not enough years of experience behind them. There's one Navy SEAL told me he liked working with me because I had more gray hair. OK, I'll, I'll take that. But what it comes down to is having more of those and making sure there's also that transition between when they leave the service and they get into uh, the VA system. Or another part that there's a huge gap is for reservists and guardsmen. When they're with their unit in active duty, they go back to their fort when they, when they come uh, back to, to CONUS, the, the, the continental United States. They have those groups that can work with them. They have a lot of base services. When they go back to the reserve bases, their unit is dispersed. And they don't have that. So that's going to be requiring a lot more work. I think we could do more with training civilians on how to handle military PTSD. Uh, but I'll tell you one other thing I tell them. People have a choice with this. Because I always think it's important for people with, with a problem to understand they have a choice. And this is the choice. A person who has experienced severe combat. Now, I can't even imagine. I have not been in that. I can't even imagine it. But they have a choice. They can be a victim the rest of their life because of it. Always be underneath this boulder that holds them back from doing anything. And, and quite frankly, it's sad to see many of them living in their mother's basement, you know, playing video games, uh, subduing themselves with vodka or whiskey all day. They can be a victim and not move anywhere. Their second choice is they can be a survivor. They can say, you know what, despite what happened to me, I'm moving forward. Uh, I'm going to have these thoughts sometimes, I'm gonna, but I've got to get back to work. I've got to get moving forward and, and do what I can despite what happened. The third choice is they can become a thriver. 
they could turn this into a source of strength because they have been through what they've been through. They are stronger, faster, better, smarter than most people. They can teach other people how to handle it. They can say, you know, this is a source to make me a better person. Now, over the years, there have been millions of people in our wars who have been traumatized by combat fatigue, shell shock, whatever that is. But it is only within the last decade or so that we've really begun to address that. And this is part of what I see our assistant secretary working with all the groups to make sure that DOD doesn't have to reinvent the wheel, uh, the VA can get up to snuff to where it needs to be, that the programs within HHS can do what they're supposed to be using evidence-based care. And we don't have to have everybody doing it on their own. But really say, uh, just like everything else, I mean, every branch of the service and HHS and every community doesn't treat diabetes differently, doesn't treat cancer differently, doesn't treat heart disease differently, they don't deliver babies differently. So why don't we do the same thing with mental health? And that's where we can make moves. Thank you. Uh, I just want to make uh, two follow-up comments, one to this gentleman's question and Congressman Murphy's comments or response, and then coming back to Patrick and DJ's question about prevention. So the first thing is, is that um, you know, the military has it's taken what, the Civil War, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan. So it's taken like a few wars to finally sort of realize that um, you know there are psychological consequences to war, not just physical consequences. And everything Congressman Murphy said is absolutely true. But uh, uh, we need to also be, I think, honest or candid at least. Um, our understanding of PTSD and how experiential stress affects us, the brain. I mean, how can somebody be relatively normal? And then in the span of whether it's a IED explosion or repeated tours of duty be irrevocably changed. That's what happens, but we don't know the underlying pathology or what all the genetic and constitutional vulnerabilities to that are. And truth be told, our treatments are effective. They're better than nothing, but they're far from optimal. Um, so a lot more has to go into understanding this film. And also something that General uh, Peter Corelli, who knew nothing about mental health and got religion as a result of his overseeing the uh, war in Iraq, uh, came to appreciate that. I want to see a diagnosis. I want to see a way of diagnosing this, because there is a suspicion that people do malinger. Now, I think that's a very unkind thing to say, but you know, that is a reality of this. So there needs to be a, a better understanding of the condition as well as a, addressing what's obviously the manifest need. In terms of DJ's question about prevention, I think the point that Patrick is making is that prevention comes in many forms. It's not just primary prevention, like we know that somebody's at risk for heart disease and we're going to treat you so it never even becomes a possibility. There's primary, secondary, tertiary prevention. The serious and persistently mentally ill, the, the, you know, it's like tuberculosis. We used to put people in sanitaria. You know, there's no sanitary anymore. It's polio. We had iron lungs. There's no iron lungs anymore. Um, we're not going to have these needs for these programs for people who have progressed that far in the illness if we do things like we can. Now, the other side of that coin is um, interdicting people with respect to the checkup from the neck up um, when they're getting their primary care or their non-psychiatric care. And for that, we need this integrated care model, this distributed care model. Um, psychiatry, mental health care needs to rejoin medicine. Um, next Friday, next Friday by happenstance, we're having, meaning the APA is holding a, uh, uh, a forum at the, the National Press Club on integrated care where a very uh, comprehensive report on the model of care, the economic consequences, the uh, expected effects and outcomes uh, would occur um, uh, with a implement an integrated care model being implemented. So as I was saying before, there's different populations that need mental health care and they are seen at different places and different sort of clinical venues and we need to be sort of thinking or having approaches to deal with them in all these respects. And, and the military is, is, is another one, which is a specialized sort of venue and population, which the same body of knowledge informs, but requires slightly adapted a set of services. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, there's a gentleman in the corner. Uh, <clears throat> uh, my name is Samar Chatterjee, Safe Foundation. 
Uh, question for the congressman. Um, uh, now, uh, you have, uh, in this new law, is there, uh, do, those, those people who have gone through our so-called justice system, um, and when a judge orders a competence checkup, and when they're put through that test in the, our prisons, um, when they're under arrest, that can turn them crazy too. And I don't know, as a doctor, you may know the procedure, and it seems our justice system is turning a lot of people crazy. So given that, is there any way you can address that? Well, let me talk about a couple of things there. I think by the time a person is involved with a major crime, uh, such as a felony assault <clears throat> or murder, it's, it's too late to do something. So what happens um, in some states is the justice system changes what they do. Now this week we also the sheriff who runs the Cook County Jail in Chicago, the second largest psychiatric facility in the nation is a jail. The first largest is a jail. I think the third largest is a jail too, and it goes down the line. Um, and what what happens in some cases, like he was described to us in Chicago, or uh, also in some other states too. Let's say someone is picked up for shoplifting at some local big box store. In the case, I think it was someone who stole twenty nine dollars worth of sheets. This was a severely schizophrenic man. He didn't even know where he was. He just grabbed him and started walking out. So they prosecuted. He sat in jail for a while, running up a total cost of sixteen thousand dollars until it finally came before a judge, who said, "You know what? Uh, time already served. Case dismissed." He was back on the street. No one had provided any treatment for him. Uh, this happens all the time. Uh, the case of um, Aaron Alexis, the Navy Yard shooter, uh, it was, was uh, talked about before. It, several times he came before the police, shot the ceiling of an apartment. People upstairs were making noise. He said, oh, no, I just accidentally discharged my weapon, shot someone's tires, um, felt some woman on an airplane was reading his mind, harassing him, uh, thought his microwave was talking to him. Uh, 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 switch from three hotel rooms the same night. Now, I don't know this, but I would guess that those policemen didn't know what to do. Maybe they thought, oh, this is kind of, you know, the guy talking to his microwave. Twice, at least, to a VA hospital, um, complaining he couldn't sleep, and all they did was give him some sleeping pills, said, see your primary care physician. I don't know if that, if he ever saw a psychiatrist, a psychologist there. I don't know. I think that probably wasn't the case. But what I see here is that it's a long list of failures of a system. And then I was disappointed when the only thing the Department of Defense concluded at the Aaron Alexis shooting was it could have been prevented if they'd done a better job doing his security background check. Wrong. They done a, should have done a better job identifying when he was in the Navy and other places he had a problem and he needed treatment. Don't give him an honorable discharge if he has these kind of problems. Let's really work at, at treating these kinds of issues. So what happened in some areas, they'll have a mental health court where a judge is very clearly aware of what to do. They'll work with the system to get that person in treatment. States like you, New York that have assisted outpatient treatment. We heard from a chief of police there. He says, we don't even want these people to go to jail. A case of a gentleman who was found standing in a woman's living room. She wanted to press charges. Again, severely mentally ill. He didn't know where he was or what he was doing. He just wandered into home thinking he was his. So it took a lot of convincing for her to say, you know, he needs to be in treatment, get medication, uh, see therapists, be followed by people, have wraparound services. Much better off than putting him in a jail where he's going to learn uh, other problems. And what happens, unfortunately, in some jails, this is where it gets really third world, is uh, some of these patients are victims of assaults from other prisoners. Uh, they can be more combative uh, and aggressive, and they deal with it by giving them more sedation, maybe putting them in isolation. Um, they haven't committed a crime worthy of being in solitary confinement, but that's what happens to them, which makes it even worse. Now, so we're trying to address these by ramping up awareness more of police and how to handle that and, and having more uh, things and getting to early treatment. I, might, I do want to say this, though, for the audience. Um, uh, Chairman Joe Pitts of the Health Subcommittee of Energy and Commerce has announced that uh, they're going to do a hearing on, on this bill, uh, 3717, the Helping Families and Mental Health Crisis Act, this coming Thursday uh, at 1030 in the morning. It's very, very important. Come be there. I um, hope America is also watching, too, and people also writing their congressmen and saying become a co-sponsor of this bill. We have a long list of Democrats and Republicans. It's a very bipartisan bill. But that, I'm showing you, I'm saying that because that's a major issue. When you have a hearing on a bill and hopefully move forward to another day of a markup where we look on amendments to, as Patrick likes to say, perfecting a bill, which is part of the process, um, that's moving forward. So that's as it's going. Thank you. For one last question. Okay, one last question, sir. 
Peter Carson with Powell Tate. I'm curious uh, with the panel how you feel uh, the increase in Medicaid coverage uh, for, uh, for individuals, what kind of a positive impact, if at all, it will have on treatment for severely mentally ill. Let me hand that one to Dr. Ful to Fuller Tory. I'll pass. Oh, okay. <laughs> then it's up. Well, let me describe that. It, it depends if, uh, you know, it isn't enough to just say we're going to cover more people with Medicaid. Uh, will there be parity in the states? Because a lot of that varies by states. Are there people to see someone? You can't just say, okay, you have insurance coverage if there's no psychiatrist, psychologist, or clinical social workers to see them. If a hospital doesn't have beds, what did you say? You knew someone was in a hospital emergency for over 100 days? 150 days. days? We've heard of children who've been tied to a bed for several days or so. Um, so Medicaid isn't just the answer. You have to make sure there's treatments. Make sure there's a lot of support services available. In many places, I, uh, a Jewish health system in Pittsburgh, I'm amazed the number of volunteers they have that work with people uh, and, and provide assistance. Many places have found it effective with uh, using a re recovery model of some peer support. People who have actually recovered from uh, their mental illness and are doing quite well can be in great support for someone to help assist them through and going through the system. That's, those are the fundamental changes we need to make. So just Medicaid won't be enough. We have to make, tear down these other barriers as well to provide services. I would just um, echo that comment that it's a step, but it's far from being adequate. I mean, for one reason is this Medicaid reimbursement is certainly at the lower level of the reimbursement spectrum in terms of third-party payment. Um, in addition, Medicaid is really uh, managed through the state, and each state is determining how it's going to, you know, Man Medicare, or Ma uh, Medicaid had been in New York State largely, uh, at least for mental health care, fee for service, but it's now being converted to uh, managed care process. Um, so each state is going through a way as, that as they try and deal with how they're going to control their own Medicaid costs how they're going to administer programs and also mental health care. And then the third thing, as Congressman Murphy said, is that even if you have sort of a payment system that's viable from the states and does provide, you know, you know, at least a minimally adequate level of reimbursement, whether it's inpatient, ambulatory, emergency, um, it depends on the services being in place that are going to accept these people. And the number of beds, the number of providers, it has been eroded systematically over the last uh, at least two to three decades. So the infrastructure is not really adequate. So there needs to be a more wholesale. It's not just a financing process, although that's the lever of change. It needs to be kind of a reconfiguration of the health care delivery system when it comes to mental health care. I want to add a concluding comment to this, too, also that uh, I want to thank all the people out there who are providing help. Um, oftentimes, they're underpaid and undervalued in what they do. Um, it is the people in the military who are just phenomenal in what they give uh, as providers. It is the people in the civilian sector, the people in the Veterans Administration. It is the, it is the many volunteers out there, although I'd like to provide ways of having, allowing more of this. Um, but what still stands out there is the many people who are still suffering as family members, as the patients themselves, who are looking for a way out of this and looking for a way for hope. That can be done. It's going to take a united courage in all of us, and we can do that. Thank you. If I could just quickly. Um, I am for the expansion of the IMD exclusion in your legislation, going back to where we can find common ground. Now, here's the thing. It's all because it's a violation of parity. Medicare, Medicaid and Medicare do not have parity. So what I want to find is the nexus point for us to take this whole issue to the next level. And I think the parity thing becomes like common law. We don't have common law in what constitutes mental health. And I think we need to have an iterative process that can start to share best practices amongst the states, like Tim starts to set up in his legislation, so that people will pay for something that can be demonstrated to be effective. As, as Fuller says, he's wondering why Republicans don't get this is a, 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 a deliverable, you know. But we need to make sure those become standardized forms of care and that it's not a, you don't have to have a million conferences before you kind of nail down what's the sweet spot in terms of therapy. And I think we can accelerate this through CMS, which is going to have a huge oversight in mental health delivery, as well as through back to 
ERISA plans overseen by Department of Labor because the, the private sector has shunted off everybody that's high cost on the Medicaid system. So if we can figure out a way to show them it's a value add for them to provide these services early, you get much more cost sharing and saving sharing, which I like and I think will resonate here at AEI. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, AEI. Thanks, all of you, for coming and for an excellent panel. And I don't know, I'm optimistic with the, all the passion in this group and the growing interest on the Hill that things may get better for the mentally ill. Thank you so much.